uh, thank you for coming to the uh, launch of the Rethinking Economics textbook, an introduction to pluralist economics. Uh, ORI is an international network of student groups who are united by their shared goals of broadening economic thinking and making economics more accessible for everyone. The book was created through a collaboration between students, some of whom are over there at the door, ready to make a quick escape if necessary, um, and academics. And I think it's very appropriate that this event has also been done uh, by collaboration between Rethinking Economics, Leeds University Business School, and the International Initiative for Promoting Political Economy. Bit of a mouthful. Um, on the panel today, we have three of the editors and uh, academics from three different organisations. Uh, so would you all like to introduce yourselves? So, hi, I'm, I'm Joe. Um, I've just started a PhD here at the School of Earth and Environment. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary um, PhD, uh, also being supervised by, by Andy here. Um, broadly in ecological economics, looking at inequality and I'm Tree. Um, I used to work for Rethinking Economics. Um, I'm also one of the editors, and I've just started an MSc in economics. Hi, I'm Jay Christopher. I'm originally from the United States, but came to do a master's degree here in London and then in Paris. So that's how I got involved in rethinking. And I'm one of the editors. Okay, I'm Andrew Brown. Um, I work here too, but I'm actually here with my hat as a member of the International Initiative for Promoting Political Economy, which is indeed a mouth. <laughs> um, I'm Peter Hughes. I also work here, but um, I'm here to represent a group called uh, Reteaching Economics, a bunch of uh, early career academics who are there to really support rethinking as much as we can. I'm Andrew Mim and I also work here. Um, I th and I think I'm here in a capacity of representing the economics division. Uh, I'm also a member of the Association for Heterodox Economics and an associate of the Economics Network, so I have pucker mainstream uh, credentials. I should say that I'm not pre representing either of those institutions in anything I say. So. <laughs> okay. well, thank you. Um, I think to start off, uh, Jay Christopher has a presentation. I'm going to sneak over here. We didn't realize how bright this was when we uh, set up the table. So, wow, super dark. Uh, so just before we get started talking about pluralist economics, I wanted to give a really quick five-minute introduction to what is pluralist economics. For some of us, we've been thinking about this for years and years, and this will be mostly review. But for a lot of people, it's still a new phrase, so it's good to slow down and, and talk about what exactly we're doing here. Uh, so for most, most people, when you study undergraduate economics, it starts like this. You have one big economics textbook. It's usually Greg Mankiw's Principles of Economics, and everything you need to know about how to be an economist starts in this book. If you stay and you, you keep doing more and more in your economic studies, at some point you usually find out that, okay, it's not all one textbook. There are some debates within economics. There are people on the left, like Paul Krugman, who think that government should do things to help correct markets. And people on the right, like uh, Milton Friedman, who think that most of the time trying to fix the markets makes things worse and that we should just stay out. And, and there's also other, other things that don't really fit into the right-left boundaries, like behavioral economics, kind of different approaches that are, are slightly in, um, in a different place. But, for most students, this is sort of where it ends. This, this is the, the scope of, of an economics education. Uh, but there's, there's so much more. There, there's so many rich historical trends and rich historical traditions that provide different viewpoints and ways of looking at economics. There's Keynesian economics and the Marxists, institutionalists, Austrians, Schumpeterians, just to name a few of the, the oldest and most established schools. But, but there's also new and exciting branches of economics that are being developed just in, the, in recent years, and uh, other branches that are, are less, less institutionalized but still have, have a rich history. Um, things like complexity economics, with people coming from advanced math and physics and, and doing all kinds of cool, cool and exciting things, or 
development economics. It's looking at questions of how countries get rich from, from a different perspective than, than what you would find in normal textbooks. And, and even all of this isn't everything that you need to really understand what's going on in the economy. There's all kinds of other disciplines that are completely separate from economics that also touch upon how we understand economics and the economy. Things like history and politics, sociology, but even the hard sciences and the arts that can really influence and inspire us and in how, we, how we think about what we're doing here as economists. So when we talk about pluralist economics, we're talking about the big broad picture of, of uh, an education that covers all of these things, or at least acknowledges that they exist and that they're important and helps students find a way to discover them. And, and not pluralism is teaching everything out of one big textbook. Uh, so, so pluralism is what we want, and, and that's, that's what we're trying to do. One of the problems with pluralism, as you might see, is there's about 40 different pictures on this slide, and it is very difficult to be an expert in all of these different things and to, to really be comfortable teaching all of these things. It's also very hard to fit all of this into a three or four year economics degree. So those are some of the challenges that we're up against, and, and that's partly where this textbook came in. We wanted to try to find a way to introduce students to this world of pluralism. No, you're not gonna become an expert by reading the book in any of the fields that are represented in it, but you'll know that they exist and you'll have an idea of what it looks like to study economics in a different way. And so that was, that was the hope in creating this. And now I think we're gonna talk a little more about the book and hopefully turn off the slideshow so we don't get blinded. You can clap. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping that would turn the lights on automatically. No? Is that? <laughs> so, do we know how to turn this off now? Good question. Yeah. Somebody else. Yeah. 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 Um, Turning them on and off. Thank you. Uh, so, would, it, would the other editors like to add anything to your sort of motivation uh, for writing the book? Um, I think. One of, the, one of the things that uh, motivated us to write the book was that when we were at university and we first started thinking about, oh, maybe there is something else out there apart from what we can find in Mankiw's textbook, it's quite, it's not obvious where to look for some basic int introductions. You know, you might go and speak to some of your lecturers and say, oh, read this paper, read this paper. But if you speak to, you know, post-Keynesian economists, they'll tell you all these incredibly complicated post-Keynesian papers that you should definitely read and you should know everything about them. If you speak to an ecological economist, well, you know, this is the one that you need to focus on and these are all the papers that you should read. Um, but there's nowhere that you can go really just for a basic introduction to lots of different things so you can try and figure out what, what you might be interested in. You're certainly not going to get that in your economics degree. Um, so one of the big motivations for this was to provide a resource for students that was at an introductory level when people first start thinking about what other areas of economics they might be interested in. Um, and they can just get a flavour of lots of different things rather than diving straight in at the deep end. Um, I guess for me, like a, a <coughs> the, the mistake I think that gets made in, in mainstream economics, I feel, is, is to, to conflate the, a methodology with the subject matter. Um, and and I, I went through my undergrad degree just thinking that economics was this particular methodology and really economics should be in theory is, you know, the study of whatever it is we mean by the economy um, and once you sort of change into that mindset it's, it's way more interesting and more exciting and there's sort of sense of op you know it being an open subject that, that's, that, that can be open to one's sort of creative intellectual uh, efforts uh, rather than just being a text that you've got to get through so for me that was the sort of I wish I'd had more of that sense um, when I was an undergrad. Just to yeah, jump in and sort of echo what Tree was saying, for, for my undergraduate degree, I feel like it was a four-year degree and I spent three years and all but like a month doing stuff that I thought was like kind of interesting. And then I found institutional economics and said like, wow, where has this been all this time? This is incredible. Like I could have been spending so much time reading these papers and really getting into these debates. And if, if I had found that three years earlier, I could have had a very different academic experience. And, and so in terms of actually like physically creating the book, I think another, another kind of 
a reason that it started was we thought it would be easy to do. Um, so we host all of these lectures, and we have these debates and presentations, and, and it's quite common to have a professor come in and give a speech on, like, what is post-Keynesian economics? What is ecological economics? And so we thought, okay, we'll just have them all write those speeches down, put them in a book, and then we're done. How long can it take? And, and so that... Three years later. Yeah, three <laughs> years later, well, we found that, that there were some more, some bumps and complications, but I, I think it was definitely worth it in terms of trying to lower the barrier of entry for how hard this, this should be to learn. So students don't need to organize their own events and don't need to bring in lectures from other cities. Um, they can at least just have a start with this. So that was sort of in terms of how this all got started three years ago. And one of the things that we get asked all the time from people, from economic students and from just interested members of the public is, oh, have you got a reading list? What mm. should I start reading? Um, and it's really hard, it's hard to kind of direct people to one thing and say, well, this is where, this is a good place to start. <coughs> so, and yeah, not everyone can make it down to lectures. Not everyone learns well from lectures. Not everyone can get lectures to come to their university or their city. So we wanted to bring have a resource that could bring pluralism to students wherever they were. Um. Yeah, and I'm just a kind of a final note on the, the format in terms of why a textbook, and particularly why something so formal with an academic publisher. Um, because we did consider doing something more informal, or just having these online, and we really wanted to be able to give the work, the, the, the legitimacy that would be needed in an academic setting for professors at institutions who don't already really aren't already sold in and aren't really supportive of this to be able to say look this is a serious academic work it's a serious thing that you can assign to your serious students and like th this can be quite quite appropriate for giving to students who have no idea what it's about as opposed to just the students who already know that they're looking for something and so being able to really hook people who have no idea that there's anything wrong with economics uh, was sort of a, a big motivation behind the format. Uh, would any of the people who didn't make the book like to comment? <laughs> uh, I hate to break up this impromptu reading group, but uh, yeah, any, any thoughts? Agree? Disagree? Think they've wasted three years? <laughs> you want something to be controversial say yes? No. Uh, <laughs> ideally not, but uh, be honest. No. I it, think that the, the... I've just seen it now, um, and the first thing I noticed uh, was it's slim. The second thing I noticed was it's got a good selection. I was thinking, well, what would you want to see? I'd want to see these different uh, perspectives in economics represented. The third thing is the authors are all the ones you think, well, if you could only have got them, that'd be great. And you've got them all. Um, and then maybe the most important, it looks like each chapter is relatively short and clear. Um, so I think it's an absolute win. I was really, really pleased just to look at it just now. Um, and you now I, I'm now racking my brains thinking, well, is there a book like this? And I don't think there is. And I think that's really incredible. I, I, it's like, it was such a good idea. Why didn't someone have this idea earlier and put it into practice? There's lots of good stuff in heterodox economics, pluralist economics, but I don't recall a book of this kind with so much so nicely presented in, in, in nice, clear, short chapters. So I think it's a really important contribution. I right. think the uh, most important. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, I, I, I agree with all that, and I also think what's important is the epilogue, um, which is about what is rethinking economics and how you can get involved, and also what rethinking economics wants. And crucially, it targets three things. Um, well, no, four things now. Reforming the curriculum to make it more pluralistic, more real-world applied, and more uh, educationally aware. Actually, because it talks about critical thinking, but that implies other aspects of education, which you don't really read about in most economics textbooks. And then um, the other thing it, it stresses is economics for everyone, so they're trying to break down barriers um, between experts and non-experts. Now, how well we've done that tonight <laughs> remains to be seen, but um, it's a good goal. And, and if you haven't read another book by a related group called The Econocracy, uh, I think you probably should, because it, 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 that sounds patronising. I, I would suggest that you do as well. It's a really good book. And it makes this point about the distinction between experts and non-experts and the problems of the culture of economics. It makes that point really well. So this is a good companion. So, good stuff. Yeah, just to add a point on um, the economics. So what 
this book tries to do. The, the first chapter of this is one that we wrote as an editorial team, which tells you a bit about what we, why we think an economics exists, our arguments why we think the economics curriculum should change, and why we think you as readers should be involved. Um, this is sort of specifically on the more academic side, particularly on the curriculum reform side. Another, the Rethinking Economics campaign is twofold. One is to change the way economics is taught in universities, to make it more critical, to make it more real world applied, so that the economists of the future are more critical, they think outside the box, and they're more involved with the real world. Um, and then we have another, another goal, which is public education. And one of the other problems that we see with economics, which I think a lot of it stems from the way it's taught in universities, also that it's made into a very elitist, very esoteric subject that excludes people. Um, and why does this matter? Well, if you watch any, any electoral uh, campaign footage, any, read any political manifesto, it's always talking about the economy. So the economy this, it's economics that, economic theory says this. Um, and we think that t in order to be to live in a real democracy, in order for people to be empowered, they need to understand economics. Um, so the Econocracy, um, which one of the editors of uh, this book, who couldn't be here tonight, Zach, was one of the authors of, um, is essentially a book length layout of our arguments both for curriculum reform and for public education and economics, and it has a lot of stuff on um, research that we've done on curriculums and research that we've done with YouGov about how much the public understand about economics and why we think um, it's important to read that. So yeah, if you if you do get a chance to read that, it's really easy to read and just expands a bit more on why we think all this stuff's really important. I'll, I'll pick up on a point um, Tree just made there about um, the tendency of economics to be elitist and that extends even within the discipline. Um, so one of the things I've always really liked about pluralism is this idea of respecting different perspectives. And something I was really pleased to see in this book was basically how each of these different groups were treated with the equal respect. They were all treated as having contributed something. And that's something that really often fails in economics as a discipline. Is people are very quickly dismissed if they're deviating from what's considered normal. Yeah. Okay, uh, so moving on. Um, do you think that the uh, issues you sort of touched on in about economics mm. teaching are also reflected in economics as an academic uh, subject? In terms of like the research. Side yeah, of in economics? terms of in terms of research, yeah. Well, we should start concisely. <laughs> Uh, uh, well, as concise as possible, yes. Perhaps <laughs> a little less <laughs> concise. <laughs> okay, well, you know. What do you want? Um, I mean, there's, uh, for those people that don't know, there's this thing called the Research Excellence Framework, uh, which probably at one point was a good idea. Uh, somebody said, oh, we should probably see what universities are doing and what people are doing with research, and we should probably try and measure it and see how, you know, whether it's good and have benchmarks against, you know, against one piece of work against another. And this is probably a, a decent idea at some point, but it's sort of morphed into uh, something less useful, perhaps. Um, and the problem in economics is the way... OK, so th this works by a, a panel of people looking at submitted work and judging the quality of that work. Um, so it very much depends on the preferences of that group of people, but that, that in itself is a reflection of the, of the disciplinary norms. And the disciplinary norms in economics, as already sort of discussed, are, are very much around mathematical formalism and, and based upon certain key principles, which I've noted are explained in this in somewhere in this book: equilibrium, rationality, optimization, these kinds of concepts. And basically, if you're not doing that kind of work, it's very unlikely that your work will be regarded as as of a high quality. Therefore, you won't get a very good research excellence framework score. Therefore, you won't get research funding. Therefore, for, uh, departments won't have any incentive to hire people who, unless you're, they're doing that kind of work. So there's a there's a dynamic there which is anti-pluralist in, in in a way. So I think yeah, that's a slightly longer answer, but not hopefully not too long. Yeah. Has anyone got anything to add, or has Andrew nailed it? Just make a point. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, while well, I agree with you, Andrew, on that point. Uh, Certainly, I think it has to be said since 2008, there has been a, a move in some of the top journals, 
for example, looking at economic history, which was completely gone, looking at what was wrong before 2008. And there are sort of a American Economic Review, top five, five star journal, which now does look at banking crisis and financial crisis and slightly different things, but it is essentially still within that same paradigm. But I think it's for, for balance, there has been a small or medium sized switch in the topics since, that, uh, since 2008. So that's all. I, I, I'm always surprised at how I, I think I, I would agree with that, and, and uh, in a sense, that's a sometimes creates a bit of a straw man for uh, presenting a, you know, an argument for pluralism. Well, you know, you, don't, you never talk about this. Well, yeah, we do. Um, but I, the thing that I find so surprising is how slow the when that bubbles down to the un undergraduate level. I, my my extent of my you know experiences up to a master's level, uh, how how little of that has come down, and and sometimes you know I've I've read this point and pe people have occasionally said yeah well you know it kind of makes sense you know it takes a while you know just like as if it is you know uh, you just discovered um, you know radio <laughs> waves or yeah. something well you know it makes sense that it's going to take a while for that to be institutionalised as if you know. It, critical enga engagement with, you know, at a methodological level with your subject matter is a kind of a discovery. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, and that's something I, 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 I think is, is yeah, it's still there and, you know, incredibly surprising. Absolutely. So just with the rest, uh, sorry, just uh, on that point, um, would the panel agree that economics teaching is improving, albeit slowly? Do you, have you, do you think there's been an improvement in what has been taught at the undergraduate level since the crash 10 years ago? Um, I think, so, t two things. One, in answer to in answer to that question directly, I think some things have improved at some universities. I think, so, um, when we were at, when we started the post-crash economic society at Manchester, um, Goldsmiths University wrote, in we, we wrote a report on the curriculum at Manchester and um, everything that we thought was wrong with it and our recommendations of how it should change. Um, and Goldsmiths University, in response to that, wrote a PPE, integrated PPE course that was looking at philosophy, politics and economics and how they interact rather than treating them as three different subjects, which is obviously incredible. Um, and Greenwich as well did a similar thing. They completely re revamped their economics course. Um, a few universities have in introduced individual modules. Cambridge, I think, in introduced a more applied module. Manchester introduced one module that's slightly more applied. Um, but then other universities have lost aspects of pluralism. So Manchester um, failed to renew the contract of one of the most pluralist lectures whilst we were there. Um, so in some senses, curriculums have have gotten worse. I don't think we've seen on a large scale a massive improvement in the teaching of economics undergraduate degrees and I think whilst I think I think it's true definitely that since the financial crisis some some research has changed some research has improved in terms of things that they examine but I think one I think a lot of it one thing that really is a sticking point with economics is that a lot of economists won't change the fundamental assumptions of the discipline so for example feminist economics you know the, the overall goal, whilst they might look at a few different things like history or whatever, the overall goal of economics, as far as the economics establishment is concerned, hasn't really changed. And from the point of view of someone who has only got to master's level, it doesn't really matter because the people, one of the things we were constantly told when we were campaigning undergraduates, like, oh, wait till you get to your mm -hmm. master's. And when you get to your master's, oh, just wait till you get to your PhD. PhD. We need to teach the simple stuff because people need to understand it. But most people never do a master's and, mo and most people definitely never do a PhD and these people are going on to work in the Bank of England, in the Treasury, in just banks in general, in policy and local government. You know, the, the people who have economics degrees go on to be powerful, influential people and, you know, they might graduate having never even been required to critically engage with um, the economy, never even considered the fact that maybe efficiency isn't the be-all and end-all, maybe unemployment isn't caused by the minimum wage we're not actually sure and I think even if even if 
economics research is improving, it's it's one, it's not improving fast enough, and two, it's not impacting on the majority of economics students. So, yeah. so sorry. <laughs> I was just, um, on what Joe was saying about it, it takes time to incorporate all of these, all of these new in innovations within economic research. Um, in my undergraduate education, when we talked about the crisis, we meant the 1970s and the breakdown of the Phillips curve. It, it was, how does inflation and unemployment not relate to each other? Like, that's what the crisis meant. This was like 2010, 2011. You couldn't <laughs> talk about something that has like, was still happening because we hadn't figured out the last crisis. So, so I think, yeah, sure, it takes time, but, but the fact that studying economics at an undergraduate level is so painfully disconnected from what's happening in daily life, that was really the jarring thing. Um, I, I guess on the question of has it gotten better, um, definitely agree with Trey's point that it depends where you are. Um, one other interesting thing that we've seen is it seems like the crisis has emboldened a lot of other groups like sociologists or social sciences or business schools to start doing things that are traditionally economic subjects because they know the economists aren't doing them anymore. Mm -hmm. So in, in my own education, I learned most of what I learned about economics from the sociology department. Um, and, and so you, you kind of, sure, I, I got a full economics degree, but when we actually talked about the real economy, it was in history classes or sociology classes. So I, I think that's kind of a thing to keep a mind on, keep in mind for going forward of like, econ studying the economy doesn't necessarily have to mean just the subject of economics. There's a lot more, a lot more ways to do that. So I'm uh, a member of the uh, International Initiative for Promoting Political Economy. So it's actually interesting to go back. That was a, a movement which developed uh, 2006, I think it was born. It was born out of SOAS. Now it's 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 worldwide, and it one of the key planks of that movement was uh, based on an analysis of how economics has been changing and developing. I think that's very helpful for addressing this question of the degree to which it's changed since the crisis, for example, because actually quite a subtle um, uh, way in which the discipline has changed. Um, to cut a long story short, the long story you'll find, I mean, the most famous uh, exposition of, of the history of economics from this point of view um, is given by Ben Fine and Dimitri Milanakis in a couple of books which trace the history of economics from classical political economy through to the present day. Um, hard to summarise, but the, the key point would be this, that um, particularly after the Second World War, economics became very narrowly defined uh, around trying to build up uh, um, an understanding of the economy through production functions, utility functions, uh, optimizing principles in markets and everything else, the social, the historical, the political was expunged and you just focus very narrowly on a, on, on a, on a technical exercise um, of trying, uh, at the time you were trying to, through Aaron de Brer, for example, uh, prove uh, existence and other theorems for general equilibrium. Um, so you particularly if you think of the, way, uh, the demand side of that, high, uh, mathematical techniques, looking at consumer optimization and trying to uh, get a pure understanding, expunging everything else away. And the other disciplines didn't like this, and it, it wasn't a method uh, or a theory which was attractive to other disciplines. It did it, 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 it shunned them. However, this is where it gets subtle and complex. Uh, from uh, certainly from the 1970s through to the present day, the discipline has been changing a lot because it's. What has it done? Has it completely uh, gone back to a situation where you bring in the social, bring in the political, bring, uh, bring in the historical in and of itself, uh, drawing on a rich terrain of methodologies and theories uh, from those disciplines? No, it hasn't done that at all. What it has done is changed one or two of those technical assumptions. So instead of utility maximization of perfectly rational individuals, let's make them imperfectly, uh, uh, have imperfect information. So they can't be fully rational. They can't. They can't um, and that means you don't achieve perfect outcomes uh, because there is imperfect information. 
On that basis, for example, you might derive the existence of firms on the basis of people optimising but without perfect information to optimise on. So firms might minimise transactions costs, for example. You bought in an institution. Great, suddenly economics looks fantastic and bringing institutions, but on what basis? On the basis of the same methodology, optimising agents with one tweak of imperfect information, not perfect information. And you can tell a similar story for a whole range of changes in mainstream economics, behavioural economics, neural economics, happiness economics, uh, new political economy, new economic sociology. Uh, all of these are applying the same basic technical apparatus with tweaks. And then there's debates. So is complexity economics gone so far away from the original optimising assumptions that it's radical and new. Alan Kermud thinks so, he says so in your book. Uh, has behavioural economics, always all behavioural economics done, just said, well, yeah, you've still got people maximising utility functions, let's just change the shape of the utility function so it doesn't have rationality properties. Okay? So, then the question is, well, how great is this change? How important is this change? It used to be a sort of radical economist, you could say, oh, they don't do politics, they don't do economics, they don't do so 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 social, they don't do historical. Now, Mainstream definitely does, but it's the way in which they do it, the methodology that they're using to do it, which you can still question. So I think that's a very important terrain for debate, and it raises difficult questions like where does behavioural economics fit, where does complexity economics fit, and so yeah, that's that's the main point I want to make. Uh, Peter, Andrew, would you like to comment on is economics teaching improving? Can say no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking about my own context because I finished my uh, formal training and started my PhD just as the financial crisis kicked off. So I was very much trained um, in a time where uh, it had been nearly 15 years of uninterrupted economic growth and success and economists were riding a high of great success and influence and power. And then um, I'm suddenly now finding myself, having gone through that system and being trained up by those people and being said, well done Peter, you're very good at this. Um, yeah. uh, I'm now finding myself in a situation of representing a, a discipline and teaching a discipline which has suddenly lost uh, a lot of credibility. And I think rightly so, because I was one of these people that always struggled with the, the arrogance of our discipline. For very much the reason um, for how Andy was describing how economics has changed, it was always very much this methodology um, and the dismissal of anything that went beyond that. So I've, I've definitely been seeing more and more people willing to embrace the idea of how economics is currently done is not good enough. And I've, I've definitely seen that been happening since I've started teaching. Which, um, as my experience as a student, I never saw once. I never saw... Uh, sorry, my person who ended up supervising me, you, on the back of this book, Sheila Dow, she was the one person as an undergraduate student that went, Perhaps this isn't good enough. Um, that was one person across six years of my life <laughs> of very formal economics education. So I think it has improved. Just because people are now willing to engage with this idea of economics in this highly, tightly defined thing that was sort of developed during the 70s and 80s wasn't, yeah, people can now publicly question that and say, maybe this isn't enough. Maybe it isn't enough to say economics is about rationality and anything beyond that rationality, that's sociology's realm. That was largely how it was pitched to me, was economics is about rationality, however you want to define that, and then irrational behaviour, or non-rational behaviour, that was sociologists. And now that's okay to say that's perhaps not right anymore. I'll keep re stop repeating that point. <laughs> I'd like to come in with an anecdote, if that's okay. okay. I was in well, Sanford. It's not too long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm responsible for timekeeping. I feel a bit, little bit victimised there. <laughs> uh, so, I was in San Francisco in 2009 at the American Economic Association conference. I was at a session organised for a great teaching in economics. Okay, this is all relevant. Uh, cool. <laughs> uh, so. And there was somebody at the, from the floor spoke to the panel and said, don't you think after the crisis we should be teaching more Marx, Keynes, this kind of thing? And this so-called great teacher in economics said, no, 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 I don't think we should let a once in a 75-year event change what we teach. 
which I thought was fairly shocking. But well, what was equally shocking was the fact that everyone in the room went, "Oh yeah," <laughs> because you know you, you don't want to change everything you've been learn you've been you've been learning and you've learned how to teach and you've written your course materials. It's a lot of work there to change all that. So at that moment, I felt quite depressed and thought, "Oh, we really are well doomed." <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you know, but but. I think we should, in, in some defence of, of economic teaching, I think there have been some changes in the last few years which are encouraging. Um, there has been a bit more evidence on, uh, sorry, a bit more emphasis on evidence. Um, there's a bit been an, uh, even more um, attention to engaging students with real world examples and problems. Um, there's been a real effort to embrace new technologies and, 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 and better, you know, better teaching methods. So I think there have been improvements there, um, and one particular initiative that probably deserves some mention um, is the CORE project, which is, uh, stands for Curriculum Open Access Resources in Economics. This is a large funded project funded by um, INET, the Institute for New Economic Thinking, and this is a, essentially a large e-book um, and, and it's been used in quite a few universities across the across the world, including Bristol, UCL, um, and Sydney, and various other places. What's good about it? it, it the materials are, are very nice. They're very they're much more interactive. Um, it covers topics that typically aren't covered in most economics core textbooks, certainly a verbal one. So it, it goes into more detail about the environment. It, there's even a chapter called Capitalism, I think. Uh, which is quite extraordinary in itself because most economics textbooks before this didn't even barely use the word capitalism. You wouldn't know that we were living within capitalism reading most of these textbooks. So the fact that there's a large section there talking about capitalism is quite encouraging. Um, and there's also much more, as I've already mentioned, much more em emphasis on evidence. So they, 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 look, they look at more evidence, they play around with data, um, and they try and get people acquainted with facts uh, more early than the, than previously, it's it's not just trotting out theory for the sake of theory. It's it's much more engagement in the real world because they recognise that engagement is important. If, if you're bored, you're not going to learn anything because you're just not going to try and take it in. And that that's that's so that's good. That 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 is good. I think I've got plenty of other things that I, I think are wrong and really bad about core. <laughs> but we can come on to those later if you like. Uh, but uh, you know, just to be fair and to provide some balance. Uh, that is a that is a development I think ought to be applauded. You know, two cheers for the core, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> Can I make a quick comment on core, just on the rethinking's a position on core? Um, we also kind of applaud their engagement with the real world, which I think is since like severely lacking with economics degrees. But I think our main criticism of core is that it's nowhere near good enough. It definitely is much better as a teaching resource, it's much more exciting, it's much more accessible, but it, CORE have, you know, they've said to us and they've said publicly that they do not endorse pluralism. They, yeah, they talk about capitalism, but they talk about how wonderful it is and how much it's changed the world, which, you know, some economists think, but some economists don't, and they're not willing to engage with, with that debate in the way that we would like to see in economics degrees. Um, and obviously, pluralism is kind of our, as as it says on the tin that's our the most important thing for us is that economics I think our, our biggest criticism of core is whilst it's engaging with the real world it's essentially still an authoritarian method of teaching it still says this is economics economics is this methodology and this is how you look at the world whereas what we want to see from economics degrees and what we hope we bring you in this book is all right some people look at the world in this way some people look at the world in that way why don't you have a read of all these different ways and decide which one you you like best um, and compare that to the evidence, which I think CORE um, seriously lacks. And also to see which one, which method applies to the problem you're trying to solve. I think that's kind of the whole other missing part of if you only have a hammer, then everything's a nail. But when you've got a whole toolbox of different things, you can have more sophisticated answers to different questions. I mean, it's also worth putting in context this point about the way economics has changed. So one way of looking at core is it's able to bring in history um, because now you have a methodology which says history is important in so far as we don't assume perfect markets, perfect information. Therefore, we can 
um, derive uh, institutional and historical results using our old method just tweaked a bit. 30 years ago you couldn't have got history in at all through that, that route. But then the question is, well is it, I mean that question is what, what Andrew said, uh, is it a really good thing? Because if you don't believe in that methodology in the first place then merely tweaking it to bring in history, to bring in finance, let's bring in finance as some sort of response to imperfect information for example, um, is that making things worse? Uh, because you really don't understand finance if it's purely about imperfect information amongst otherwise uh, you know, rational optimizers. That's not the way you're ever going to understand finance. So it looks like there's a progress and everyone says, oh fantastic, economics is changing. But actually its core method is remaining and just being tweaked at the edges. Uh, so my last question to the panel is... Uh, yes, question. This is actually a question specifically for Peter. As your position doing undergraduate PPE things now that you've just taken on, like what you're in a position where you're looking at a, a curriculum that is aimed at you know, looking at a broader spectrum of what economics can be. How would you see that changing at undergraduate level going forward? And that's quite a personal question for me. <laughs> 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 In terms of how, how would I see PPE programs developing well, like, over time? Or just like, you know, in this situation I have been taught in economics, politics and philosophy as separate things um, with a couple of modules, um, such as second year module in ethics and economics that is a definitely a crossover one, but it has very much been taught in a separate way and that's not how the course was sold to me. The course was sold to me as being an interconnected thing. And like, obviously, you've only just taken this role once, so <laughs> yeah. you've got a chance. But I feel like going, oh, justify what, how you've been sold this course. Um, <clears throat> I mean, this is where I really see things like the, uh, being a pluralist economist myself. This is where I really see, like I said, the, the re that respect of the value of other disciplines. Um, but I, I, I agree with Andrew a lot with this idea of uh, this is something fundamentally incompatible with how economics works currently, which sort of acts as this very difficult barrier to overcome and uh, to fully engage with things like philosophy and politics. Um, I know I disagree essentially with this reluctance to engage, particularly say philosoph uh, philosophically, with the motivations and the underpinnings of how economics works. Um, you need people who are willing to engage and capable of engaging across those disciplines. Um, in order to make it a properly integrated thing. Because um, we're pushed into silos, unfortunately. As academics, we're pushed into these shapes. Things like, as Andrew mentioned earlier, the uh, research excellence framework pushes you towards conforming to a certain silo and discourages largely uh, proper, proper cross-disciplinary work or interdisciplinary work. My hope has always been that student-led, people who haven't been pushed into a shape, people who haven't been siloed, those are the people that can resist and push this and say, no, there are links here. And it, that's <coughs> uh, that actually sort of neatly brings us on to the fi my final question. Uh, how can student groups, uh, such as Rethinking Economics, work with academics to sort of enact the change that we've been talking about? Um, well, so I'll respond to both those questions to James and to Chris. Um, one of the things I think that you end up not, well, forgetting if you're older and also never learning if you kind of just coming into economics is that economics as a single discipline has not always existed. Before the Second World War, there's no such thing as economics, there's political economy. And that's what you studied. Adam Smith, who a lot of people hail as you know the father of modern economics, wasn't an economist. He was a political economist. And this kind of distinction between the two um, was developed by there's a number of theories as to why how it ended up the way it is. But one of one of the things was that policymakers, in order to make easy decisions, wanted numbers rather than kind of a discussion on what was right and what was wrong. It's, oh, which policy should we go for? Well, this one's a 70, this one's a 50. So economics kind of offered this or claimed to offer this scientific answer to society's problems. So rather than political, which was, you know, just a matter of opinion, the economist would 
go away and research and come back with a number and that's why it kind of economists base a lot of their credibility or of what they see as credibility on the fact that you know it's a, it's a science not kind of an art like politics or philosophy um, and a lot of the time you went again when you talking to academics and because I did PP as well and at Manchester and that was sold to me on a hey these three things really interrelate why don't you come and study all three of them which they do but then when you get to uni you do an economics module you do a politics module you do a philosophy module and never never sh will they will they meet or or interlink and when I, th I think one of the um one of the things like you say about pluralism that is giving this kind of respect to other things and and just being humble enough to ac accept that there are ideological underpinnings to economic theory um Vicky Chick did a, a great article on value judgments in economics and um, that was talking about, you know, people say, oh, well, this isn't a value judgment. We're just trying to look for the most efficient outcome. But the fact that you're looking for the most efficient outcome rather than the most equitable outcome or the most sustainable outcome, that is a value judgment. And I think it's just it's a, it's arrogance on the part of economists that they can't accept that other that one, they're not a physical science, and two, that there are other influences on their own thinking and on their own discipline um, that shape the way that they think and the way that they look at the world. And I think that's one of the really good things about the Goldsmiths degree, and I think a lot of other degrees have a lot to learn from that, is that it does make a real effort to be like, okay, so this is economic theory, what are the philosophical underpinnings of this? What are the political implications? Because from anyone who's outside of economics, it's really obvious. So like monetarism, which is, in theory, you know, it's, it's a technical monetary theory has massive political implications about what government should do, about what policies sh you should employ. There's big philosophical underpinnings about, you know, what people think the role of government should be, what the role of money should be, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's been really detrimental to it. Economics, this kind of separation from politics, and one of the things that is argued for a lot in the economocracy is that all economic students should have to do philosophy and politics modules um, and I think one of the things so going on to the question about student groups so you often find in unis that have PPE degrees that the rethinking student groups are often made up of PPE students more so than economic students because they have a more rounded they, they see the other side of it and see the disconnect a bit more um, so I think one of the things that students can do is you know, hosting interdisciplinary events like looking at you know things in current affairs and get getting speakers in to to debate with each other. So when we did a conference in Manchester, we had this uh, event series on called Conversations Across Borders, where you'd have different economists coming in to chat to each other about different things. And I think just economists can can be so blinkered and end up in such a narrow have such a narrow experience just exposing them to different ideas and having students or other academics saying to them hang on a minute but you think efficiency is important why do you think that surely that's a philosophical or a political judgment and um, and yeah just kind of making economists aware of the fact that economics does not exist in, in isolation Uh, yeah, anyone like to add their own perspective? Yeah. Yeah, it's just a concrete proposal if anyone's interested. I'm thinking about trying to do a start paper zero. Uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of that. It's what the guys have been doing at Cambridge for quite successfully for I think more than a decade now. So they, it's an optional, not marked module that the PhD students put on for the undergrads uh, to, as, a, as a kind of you know way of structuring, uh, providing a bit of structure and sort of institutional support for providing a bit of a bit of a pluralist outlet without having to like battle too hard with uh, with um, you know the course leaders or whatever um, who have their own pressures and their own you know I think you know, I wouldn't ever I think there are good reasons why individual people structure their modules in, in, in particular ways and um, yeah so anyway con concrete proposal if anyone's interested in, in, in helping that out and I'm, I'm about to go and pluck up the courage to talk to some loves people <laughs> to, to, to suggest it um, yeah. I, 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 admire the, I admire that you've not gone to the standard proposition email and have just openly <laughs> suggested it at a public event yeah, I <laughs> uh, yeah anyone else like to add their thoughts on how student groups can work with, with academics 
I mean, it's, things are changing rapidly at the level of academia as a whole and how that's being influenced by politics as a whole. Um, in the case of economics, um, again, sort of general reason with pl the idea of promoting political economy um, is that in uh, you know in the recent past, disciplines like sociology and other social sciences were also in the grip of their own relative malaise. If you look at the uh, prevalence of postmodern postmodernism in the 80s in sociology and social theory, for example, is very difficult to bring in a conception of political economy of the of the economic. Um, but that's very much changing, and with the with the recent uh, with the financial crisis, uh, the. Of, of 10 years ago, all uh, disciplines now have an interest in the economic, but it's very difficult to find the resource if you're in a sociology department or a politics department, even a human geography department, <coughs> which is a theory of the economy, uh, because that's, that's been taken away from those disciplines and it's for so long been the domain of economics departments. So there is an opportunity because it's the thirst to know about it but there's a lack of expertise in all of the different uh, branches of pluralist economics in this book. There's a lack of expertise in other disciplines. So I think in terms of students, it would be good to continue to uh, make, make themselves heard and say we demand to know about the key things in the economy. Uh, and for academics, there's a, a continual need to unite together across disciplines to say, well, hey, I know about heterodox economics, I can help you understand the economy as a whole, but I can't help you on a range of social, geographical, political aspects. Let's get together uh, and um, have a collective development of an understanding of the economy um, based on the principles of political economy rather than trying to uh, knit together a, a, an emaciated economics and an emaciated sociology. Let's go back to the tradition of political economy and do genuine analysis of, 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 the, of contemporary conjuncture. I mean, there's an irony, isn't there, that uh, the, uh, the economists that believe in markets um, have helped create a market in education and that's put that applies to consumers of education, i.e. students, in a much more powerful position than they were before. So, you know, you can see where that goes, uh, potentially. But uh, the students have got to exercise their voice in that. So I'd, I'd advocate all students bugging their uh, programme directors uh, incessantly, um, <laughs> especially here. <laughs> okay, so that's a joke. I mean, I, I mean as you can see, you know, there's... there's the, Academics are constrained in what they can do, but there's, there's a lot of sympathy. People, you know, academics want students to be happy and learn and, and get something out of their experience. So, if you talk to talk to uh, if your students and you talk to your academic heroes, um, then that's probably they'll probably be sympathetic and do something about it, or at least try to do something about it. So, I think that's worth doing. The other thing I was going to say, and I think this is it goes back to what Tree said about the type of events that student groups can hold. I mean, I, the danger with this book actually is that it's a ch series of chapters about different schools of thought in, in economics and you read it and you go, what do I do now? You know? um, uh, and, and there's a danger in, in not actually, you know, you could read them as completely separate things. So you could either end up really confused or you could uh, end up knowing that there are these eight different schools of thought in economics but not actually understanding how they relate to each other, what the strengths and weaknesses are or anything like that. And that's not the book's fault, that's just the nature of the, the, the beast. Right? Um, so you need somehow to get some interaction between these different ideas and that can only really come through dealing with a concrete problem and saying right, what is actually going on here and how do we actually get to the bottom of it and get these different people in a room to say well this is how I look at it, this is how I look at it and the, a lot of these debates, a lot of these disputes will at least be, become alive, you'll understand the, the perspectives a bit better and you may you'll understand the issue a bit better so the kind of events that you talked about sound great to me and I'd also echo and Andy's point about you know, bringing in people from other disciplines, because while, or at least bringing in a different perspective, because while economics is as it is, it's, it's quite hard for those of us, even those who are interested in this stuff or sympathetic to it, to be really good at it. You know, because I, I feel really bereft. Like I didn't do PPE, uh, uh, and you know, I've had to train myself in philosophy, but it's actually quite hard. Um, <laughs> so. Um, you know, it's difficult to be good at all these things. So in some cases, you, you do have to bring in people from other perspectives. So I think that kind of event is a gap of the kind of thing that students can and, can do. Uh, and and it's better if it's organised by students too, because students are more likely to turn up. 
I think whilst that is a danger with the book, fortunately we preempted that and there's a bit at the back that tells you how to join Rethinking Economics. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first thing students should do. Uh, yeah, um, so one point on that. Um, I guess so one of the big questions I have now that this is out is what do we do with it? What is the next step for how do we use this thing? And so something that, that I've done is we've created this workshop based on the book where we've tried to do really quick two-page summaries of each of the schools of economic thought. And then we put people in, in groups, have them take five minutes, read one of the schools of thought. And so that whole group then becomes behavioral economists, or they become ecological economists. And then we give them some crazy, silly problem, like there's a giant bubble in the pizza market, and, and pizza prices are skyrocketing and nobody understands why. And then say, you're a bunch of feminist economists. What's going on? Tell us. And then we make them try to come up with a speech, try to come up with a, a skit to act it out and like show us what is happening. And, and it's been incredible how how quickly people have just accepted the premise and gone with it. Um, and particularly people without economics backgrounds uh, of when you say like, okay, this is, this is a group of economists and this is how they think, like, just go for it. And, and you get that interaction. You get people sort of seeing between the schools and saying like, well, maybe like the Marxists and the cooperatives, like they're not all that different. There's some, there's some crossover here. And like, how do these things work together? So that's, that's one thing that we've done. And, and I've, I really want to see what can we do as a, as a network and as a community to try to standardize and, and really like amplify being able to do things like that, and particularly coming up with methods that can be used in classrooms. So one of the questions I got was, okay, I'm a teacher, I want to use this, what do I do with it? Um, and I, honestly, I, have, I don't have a great answer yet, but I think that's one of our tasks both tonight in our discussions and going forward is to think of like how do we structure debates how can you have assessment based on things like this how, how can we really make this a, a part of education so I, I would close with that as a question for the audience and a question for everyone viewing online and just one last question um, at the beginning at the beginning of the, the talk it, we said it, it, it's crazy that something like this didn't exist before you just kind of assume somebody would have done it what other holes are there like that in the world of economics, where there's something that in retrospect, it's gonna be so obvious that it should have been created, but right now doesn't exist. If we can identify those things, we got lots of people, lots of time, that's, we need new projects to work on. So ideas from the audience, ideas from, from the internet, and let's go rethink economics. <laughs> 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 Any uh, questions from the audience for the panel? Or points of discussion. Yeah, just or points of discussion. You don't have to do the inflection at the end to make it a question. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, a question. Uh, I did <coughs> PP at Manchester and I did a master's in economics, PhD in economics, and now I'm a teaching <laughs> fellow in economics. And I do some economic history. And I still feel like I know nothing. <laughs> so, <laughs> how, how do you address a situation where most students who do end a three year degree but have to pay £9,000 a year, how do they get the most out of those three years given the need for this interdisciplinary program? It's interesting because one of the, when we, um, when I was still working for Rethinking before I started my master's, we did a training day at Goldsmiths with um, Dan and Hannah who were here. And one of the things that the people at Goldsmiths who were doing this P integrated PPE degree, one of the things they said was that they felt, compared to people who did a more traditional economics degree, they didn't have as many of the technical skills. Um, so they were sort of, in even though they, they kind of, they really enjoyed the degree and saw the value in the pluralism they felt at a disadvantage in the job market and when students are paying nine thousand pounds a year you want you don't want to sort of come out the end of it having had a load of good debates but not able to get a job um so yeah i don't, I don't know if i really have an answer to it but i think you want i think whilst that one of the things that economics needs to strike a balance with is having kind of technical skills and ways to actually engage with economic data because that was another thing that I certainly felt I never 
learned in my undergraduate degree was how to, you know, I could draw some good graphs and I could regurgitate some good equations and theory, but I couldn't actually engage with any economic data. And I think a lot of, the, so the Bank of England certainly don't necessarily hire from economic students anymore. They look at physics students, they look at math students because they've got better skills in terms of actually analysing what's going on in the real world. So I think, that, and again, I, I don't have an answer to this, so maybe the educators on the panel will can you know provide some ideas but I think there needs to be some kind of there needs to be more of a focus on real world applied skills but ha producing students and students coming to the end of the degree having learnt these skills but also being able to critically engage with what these skills are really teaching them and what they're teaching them to do and what they why why they're learning them um, okay. I, um, yeah just help them. For me, that I have I've had exactly share exactly that, that feeling. I think partly that's because when you step outside and go and ask your mum or your dad, and, and they say, "Well, you know, what's going on with this?" then and you, you should, you know, one reasonably assumes that if you've done three years studying this thing, you should at least have like some insight beyond what you would have picked up had you just been reading the FT, you know, regularly. And I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure that you do. And that, for me, was the big, that, that you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, at the end of the three years of doing PB, I could pick up the FT and convincingly explain what was going on in it. Um, and I, you know, maybe I'm just an idiot, but I, 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 I feel there's a part of it. To do, you know, so, and maybe that, that, that you know, is a, is a, is a, um, a thing that um, would, you know, is, is in a sense, is appealing both to employers and without being, uh, you know, whilst fulfilling whatever whatever we, you know, society thinks economists should be specialising at. Again, so for me, it's rather than focusing on a methodology, it's focusing on the subject matter. What, what is it that people look to economists to, to be able to explain um, and, 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 and focus on that? And that presumably would be, uh, you know, that there there's definitely would be an empirical component to that, um, that, that, that you know that arguably isn't being as met as well as it could be in, in the undergraduate. I think it's Agreed. funny you make the, the point of reading the F, not being able to read the FT. Um, in the Iconocracy, there is a quote from a rethinking student saying that if she had read 100 years of the Financial Times, it wouldn't have helped her get a single point on any of her economics tests, um, which seems about right. I mean, maybe you'd get one bonus question somewhere, but. It, that's sort of the disconnect that we're speaking of. And, and so for me, in my education, I, I was taught by fairly critical professors, but they always stress, like, we have to teach you these theories and these methods, or you won't be able to go on and do a master's degree. You won't be able to go on and do a PhD. And so I, I did the, the theories, and I, I finally start looking at applying for PhDs. And in the U.S., at least, all of the top 15, 20 schools said you must have two years of mathematics education. That is absolutely mandatory. It's helpful if you've studied some economics. They, they weren't interested in the theory. All they wanted was to make sure you could do the math. Um, and, and so you get a year outside of your degree, you've forgotten all the specifics of the actual theories and the ISLM curve and how it all matches up. Um, I, there was some statistic about like 95% of the things that you learn in a basic macro course are gone after three weeks. Uh, and, and so it, it for, for me, and, and this is sort of taking off the official rethinking head of, but if Jay Christopher was going to design the system, it, it, it seems like we should really fundamentally rethink what we want an undergraduate economics degree to do. What should students come away from this with? And, and, and move to a model where the undergraduate degree today looks closer to what we all think the PPE should be, of, of asking the big questions and thinking about the economy and thinking of like what our place in it is. And then when you get to the master's level, that's where the specialization can occur. Because you have to really question, like, how important is all of the maths for a basic economics student, or for an undergraduate economics student? I can agree that there, there is an important place in the world for that neoclassical position in the math uh, of, like, I wouldn't want to just completely lose that from the face of history. So it should still be preserved in master's degrees. But... But at that point, you've had three or four years to understand what the discipline is, and then you can make the choice to specialize, but not to start off at the very beginning learning this one fairly narrow thing, but putting rethinking hat back on, because we do not. 
because there's a lot of different ways that you could do this. So that's sort of it's not like there's an easy official answer for this. Um, but 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 I think these are the kind of really big conversations we should be having, and, and specifically having with university professors and university administrators who are in a position to change some of these things. And, and that's why the last three years have been so exciting with Goldsmiths and, and Greenwich and Kingston and some of the different places that we've had that have been experimenting and really playing with what you can actually do with an economics degree. And, and so I'm hopeful that going forward we can have more of that. Uh, yeah, so taking off my chair hat for a moment and putting on my Chris Harley hat. Um, I would... Yeah, I would definitely agree, and I, I think the issue is that it's there's so much focus on mathematical formalism, both in economics education, and in the in the subjects more broadly, uh, in, well, in the academic side, um, and I just sort of question how useful it is to be able to, you know, prove in well to sort of express the the same argument in a very rigorous mathematical way rather than being able to explain uh, lots of different ideas in you know broader, less mathematically formalised ways. Um, I think that breadth and also not focusing so much on theories uh, which can be mathematically expressed would be very helpful, because speaking as someone who worked uh, for the Treasury for a year, they don't care. They do not care about the if, if you can sort of prove this uh, theory using mathematics, they care about what's the idea, can you process the data? And I think perhaps that's something which doesn't come through so much in uh, economics degrees. I mean, just to, I mean, one thing I would stress is the importance of the, um, the institutions of the universities and the institution, the, the disciplines for each uh, of the of the academic uh, uh, courses that you do, so you have to fit a benchmark uh, if you're going to deliver an economics degree, um, and that constrains what you can deliver in an undergraduate and at master's level, and that's why it's extremely important that rethinking economics and students and everybody pressure the authorities like they are doing to make the degrees more pluralistic, because until that argument is won we really are constrained in what we can do with an economics degree. It's very difficult to avoid the pitfalls you've all mentioned. So, yeah, keep shouting about the need for pluralism in, in, in the economics curriculum. I think there's some points from the audience. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, hi. Um, so what, what motivates me about this is, in the end, uh, the drive to create a better world. Um, so, and, and you slightly touched upon it in some, some events. Um, but what I'm interested in is so like, how does this changing education and economics eventually change the way that the world is kind of governed, kind of change the way economics interacts with how society is, is uh, designed? Um, and, and or how does kind of, how does how the existing filters in, in institutions and such um, create barriers to pluralist thinking getting in there, but is it just if we if we get a better education, does it automatically trickle up into the institutions? Um, and what does pluralism create there? Is that if there's um, a person from, say, one end of the pluralist spectrum in that position, does that have an entirely different outcome as to what is the politics coming out of that, as if it were a pluralist economic from the other end of the spectrum? Does that make sense? So I think one of the things um, that we've talked about a lot in rethinking economics in terms of politics, one of, I think, and I think one of the really like beautiful and wonderful things about rethinking economics is that we do have people from across the political spectrum, and you know, it's rethinking isn't kind of a right or a left thing. We have Austrian economics, which is completely excluded from undergraduate degrees, which is you know firmly on the right, and then we have Marxists, which is firmly on the left, and everything in between. And I think. With, on a, with an official rethinking hat on, I don't think we're, we're not pushing for a better world necessarily, we're pushing for a better education and we think that the world is a, be a better place when pe where people are critical and people can engage with the real world. Speaking on a personal level, in terms of hats, taking my rethinking hat, put my tree hat on, I think 
the world will it will inevitably become a better place when people become more critical and people can people are f forced to admit their assumptions and their value judgments in their theory. I think one of the biggest problems with economics education is people think that you know the there is only one way to create create better world because I think most economists aren't kind of in it thinking oh well not really bothered about a, a better world you know this is just how it is I think a lot of them think genuinely believe that neoclassical economics is a way to create that and I think the and this is where all the philosophy and the politics comes in is when you're discussing actually how to create a better world what is a better world you know I've got an opinion about what that is and other people have different opinions about what that is and I think economists are let off discussing that and debating that they, there's just kind of this assumed agreement amongst economists that we all kind of or they all kind of think the same thing and I think what whilst I don't think an economics education should ever prescribe that but I think the spaces should be opened up to debate what that is um, and I do think that will trickle up and that is one of Rethinking's long term strategies is that we want to train the economists of the future whilst universities aren't doing that what we're trying to do is get get people at undergraduate level at sixth form level and get them thinking critically thinking about their assumptions thinking about their politics and their philosophy and how that influences their economics and yeah whilst we whilst we're also pushing for top down change I think trickle up is the best we can hope for until that happens uh, unless there's any other points I do think it's important to stress that it's what both several people stressed already. If you go into government, you go into civil service, first year microeconomics is everywhere. Okay, so how does the Treasury assess all public spending? They assess it through uh, Green Book cost benefit analysis, which is basic first year economic principles. Is there an externality? Does the externality justify the government expense? So it, 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 the economics is suffuse. Uh, across all key decisions in our society. Uh, and it's not highfalutin economics, it's first year economics. We need to change that. Uh, do you have a... I'll be brief. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I think um, going back to my first point, which was about the epilogue of this book, talks about you know, what, is, what, is, what is economics education supposed to do? I mean, that's a fundamental question. I think that's the most important question that you have to try to answer before you even before you, before you describe it, any, any kind of curriculum, what goes in it, how you do it, what what's the purpose of what you're trying to do, and then and we've all got views upon that. But who who decides? You know, who decides what that curriculum is going to look like? This is the point about the, the democratic or democratic deficit. You know, how does that process start? So I think these debates that you're having are really important. Just getting people to think about what do we want. Do we want to train people to do a master's degree? Do we want people to have particular explanations about how the world works? Do we want people to be open-minded, critical thinkers? Do we want people to be change agents? Do we want, what, what, do we, what do we actually want out of, out of this process? And then you start with that question, and then you move forward uh, to design the thing. And that's not an answer. It's just that <laughs> but if you get that wrong, or if you're not clear about that, you're not going to get anywhere. Okay. Um, well, thank you all for listening. Um, if we've inspired you, then you can get a copy at the back for the low, low price of £20. Um, if you're interested in, in learning more about rethinking economics and maybe getting involved, then we've got uh, Hannah over there and Dan holding the iPad. Um, and they, they work for rethinking. They can talk you through that. Um, yeah. Feel free to enjoy some wine and continue this discussion a little less formally. Yeah, mate. Of course, yeah.